kind of message planned out as of yesterday, um, actually as of Friday, and yesterday it just kind of got changed. Um, it's in the same vein, so I think what's, what's emerging here is maybe a series that'll last a couple Sundays, may, maybe three. Um, I will be gone the first Sunday um, of September, actually, I'll be gone that whole weekend. Um, Christy will be here. I'll be gone. I'll be in Nashville. And so I think this is probably going to last um, until, until then. Um, this is a very, very fundamental teaching, very, very basic teaching. However, it's never taught. Um, and really, in my opinion, this is probably the f- one of the very first things that a new believer should learn um, and, and it really speaks about identity and who you are and the kind of how things work. Um, and we probably won't, won't get to that, the meat of that, until next week. Um, some of you that have been here for a while, um, I've, I've not preached on this for two years here. Um, and it's really one of those things that we kind of just need to be on the same page. We've got a lot of new folks that are here that's never heard this. We kind of need to be on the same page. And honestly, for, for a lot of the, you that were here two years ago, you probably don't remember. So uh, I, I just want to go over that. And, and it's the revelation of spirit, soul, body. All right. Um, you are a spirit. You have a soul that lives in a body. And I have scripture that backs that up. Um, some of this is very new to people, and they don't really, it's, it's, it's different. I want to back up from that today, though, and, and start. I've got two scriptures today. That's probably where we'll end at. Um, Isaiah 55 is where we're going to go. Um, I was, I was um, this week in prayer, I was just kind of um, looking back a little bit, looking backwards. Um, November's coming up pretty quick, and my birthday is in November. And it just so happens that I was, uh, was born again on my birthday. And that was, this November will be five years ago. And so I'm a little over four and a half years old in the Lord. And I was just kind of looking back. I, I journal. Uh, some of you guys know that. I'm an avid journaler. I journal all the time. And, and I have stacks of, of journals, notebooks that I write all the time. And I was just kind of looking back at those times. And, and one underlying theme has been brought out to my attention that it seems that I am consumed with. And it's this idea of what is being born again? What's it about? What is salvation? What does it mean for me to be born again? I reject the teaching that says you get born again so you can go to heaven when you die. I believe that's true, but if that's the only reason you got saved, number one, I kind of question your motives to begin with. Number two, um, that's a terrible and horrible watered-down gospel, and basically it's an insurance policy. Um, At the heart of the gospel is transformation. And we're transformed into his image. Um, Jesus in Luke 4, quoting Isaiah, said, I've come to save that which is lost. What was that that was lost? The image. Um, God told Adam and Eve, uh, the day you eat of the tree, you will surely die. They ate of the tree, they didn't die. What happened? Their spirit died. What is, we've been covering this for the last few weeks. What is the biblical definition of death? separation from God, right? So therefore, the biblical definition of life would be in union with God, in His presence, correct? That, he's the source of life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is life. Apart from Him, there's only death. So when Adam and Eve, before they ate of the tree, they had this perfect body, perfect mind, perfect garden, ate of the tree, curse came, they gave up their authority, the image shattered, the image died, their spirit died. Here we go through all of this that we're in today. It's very important that we understand that there's two covenants in the Bible. Two. is what we refer to as the Old Covenant and then the New Covenant. All right. So the Old Covenant 
is where we get the law from. It's where we get the Ten Commandments from. Thou shalt not and thou shalt. You know, the two tablets. You can see... Oh, they're not here anymore. What happened to them? Oh, they're in that room. All right. Well, we have two little tablets here, and one says mercy and one says grace. Um, why? Because the Ten Commandments were fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and we're no longer under the law. We're under grace. And so when you're under the Old Covenant, it's all on you. It's all on you. You make a mistake, you're done. You're guilty. If you, the Bible says if you make a mistake in the smallest, you're guilty of it all. So Old Covenant is what I do. God relates to me based on what I do. Right? Okay. All right? right? Grace, New Covenant, Jesus already did. He did. So God relates to me based on what Christ did. Amen. I access that through faith, through belief. And through that belief, I am born again, and then I start on this road of sanctification. But my spirit gets born again, and I'm already perfect, I'm already completed. I'm kind of jumping ahead to next week, but I feel like I need to lay this foundation. My mind needs to be renewed, right? So, therefore, I have a position in Christ. We've talked about this before. I have a position in Christ that says, I've been found innocent. I'm blameless. I'm guiltless. I have become the righteousness of God. Does it matter what my condition is? I access my position through faith. And the goal of the gospel is for the transformation process to take place so when my condition will match my position. Now, unfortunately, that really doesn't happen until probably we die in its totality. But the life process is we learn to begin to have our minds renewed, our nature changed to where our condition begins to match what we've already been given through Christ, which is our position. That's the goal of the gospel, okay? Everybody with me so far? You're okay? All right. All right. That's my theme, basically. And honestly, I think I've been here, what now, three years? Um, that's probably the only message I've ever preached. That right there. I do it every Sunday. It's the only thing I preach. I think it's the only thing worth preaching or at least till we get it. That's, I'm consumed by that. I'm consumed by living under the new covenant totally, completely shine away from the old covenant. I'm not under law. I'm not under Ten Commandments. I'm not under, I'm not under all that stuff. I'm under grace. I don't transform because the law says I have to. I get transformed because the Holy Spirit lives inside of me and changes my nature. Right, So you can't even change your nature to begin with. An apple tree can't wake up in the morning and decide, I think today, Zach, I'm going to be an orange tree. That, that's stupid, right? Silly. Well, it's the same thing as you thinking you can change yourself from a, from a sinner to a saint. You can't. It's, just, it's, it's ridiculous. You can't do that. Only the Holy Spirit can. Why? Because he's God. It's the same thing. I, the, the goal of that is to take some condemnation maybe and some self-guilt off of you Amen. to say, stop putting pressure on yourself. Your job is to just focus and have relationship. You will be transformed at the rate you will be transformed because you can't transform yourself anyway. Uh, does that just make you want to go... <sighs> But unfortunately, one of my biggest obstacles in teaching this stuff is what's called a religious spirit. Because church, religious folks, want to take the law, smear a little grace over it, and call it the new covenant and say, here you go. All right, you've prayed the prayer, you filled out the card. Okay, now you got to change the way you dress, cut your hair, or women let it grow out. Stop wearing what you're wearing. Wear something that looks better. Um, you got to change the way you talk. You can't go here, you can't go there, you can't drink that, you can't eat that. And 
you can't hang out with this person. You can't hang out with that person. You have to come here. No, you can't do anything in the church until you've gone through six weeks of Wednesday night classes and this discipleship class. And you, you, that, that's church. That's religion. And, and some of you don't, have not grown up in church, and you're looking at me like, that's crazy. That's the way most churches operate. This place don't. But that's the way most churches operate. Paul is out killing Christians and three days later preaching the gospel. That's the glory of the gospel. Y'all getting this at all? Yeah. Right. Um, today, I, the goal, I guess, of today is for you guys, it, it, is for me to say something to you guys so shocking and crazy that you're either going to think I'm off my rocker and you're going to go home and study to, to prove me wrong, or I'm hoping that I'm going to say something so freeing and so challenging that you're going to go home and study so you can learn how to do it yourself. Um, I, I will tell you this, that when all the chips are on the table and you're going through it, right, and stuff's going bad, what Jeff says is going to be of little consequence. It's not really going to do you a lot of good. But if you know what the Bible says and what God says, then that's what you can rely on. What Jeff says is just the word of a guy. But you need to know what the Bible says. You need to know what God says. And I can't do that for you. You have to do that. I, if I could, I would. But you have to do it. So I'm hoping today that I'm going to maybe hopefully say something to you guys that's going to spur you to drive you to go home and, and study this stuff, all right? So turn to Isaiah 55. I'm going to attack a verse that we all know and love, one of our favorite comfort verses. You just kind of have to bear with me. I actually lost my voice at Rosedale this morning for about the last 10 minutes of my message and I've got it back. Um, I don't know how long it's going to last. So um, just bear with me. <clears throat> Isaiah 55. Let me go to verse 8. You all know this verse. If you've been around church any amount of time, you've heard this verse. <laughs> For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so were my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You've heard that before? We use this verse when you have an event or a circumstance that has an outcome that you wasn't expecting, an outcome opposite of what you were praying for. And so we quote this verse and say, well, you know, God's ways aren't my ways. And his thoughts aren't my thoughts, so I'm just going to accept it that this is the way it is. I don't understand, and this is just the way God does. We do that, That's what we do. This verse, I have seen. I, I, I've seen it, and honestly, I've been guilty of it myself. This verse is used as an excuse or a justification for complacency in the midst of trials instead of allowing the trials to do what they're meant to do and spur me on Amen. to drive me on to understand the more, to understand God's ways, to understand why this happened or why this didn't happen. I'll, 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 I'll give you a point. Um, sorry, Mom. But when, when you know, Margot died of cancer, the month she died, Christy and I saw three people miraculously healed of cancer. Totally. One guy was in his deathbed, brain tumor the size like this, right? He was totally unconscious. Prayed for him. He sat up went to work the next day. My aunt died of cancer. Why? I prayed the same prayer. I had the same heart. It's the same Jeff. Somebody quoted this verse to me when that happened. 
I rejected it totally because it made me mad. Well, uh-uh. That can't be true. The Holy Spirit inside of me just flipped and said, reject that. Stop it. And I began a search of why. And I allowed that situation not to be a justification for complacency to say, stop praying for people with cancer. Well, we do that. When the C word gets bigger than the G word, something's wrong. See, here's the deal. Here's the glory of the gospel. The glory of the gospel is he wants you, God wants us to change in such a way that our circumstance no longer affect us, but we affect our circumstances. That's the glory of the gospel. You get that? We change our circumstances. We become the thermostat in the room. But unfortunately, we're a lot of thermometers a lot of times. We'll complain when it gets too hot, but we won't do anything about it. We're just thermometers. But if we're thermostats, we can actually change the temperature. Do you understand the analogy? So we will use this verse... I can see some of y'all looking at me crazy because I'm attacking one, probably one of your favorite verses. I'll just bluntly ask the question. Can you know God's thoughts and can you know his ways? Then what gives? If it's in the Bible, it must be true, right? Here's the deal. I'm going to make you wait for it. Thirsty. Here's the deal. It was true. It's not anymore. What changed? There was this veil in the temple. The temple housed the presence of God. You understand that's what a temple is. It houses the presence of God. This, tent, this veil was, what was it, 72 feet tall? I'm not sure, but it was real tall. Six feet thick. It was as thick as I am tall. And it was torn the moment Jesus died. It wasn't torn from bottom to top. It was torn from top to bottom. That veil was to keep human beings from entering in the presence of God. There was only one person, a priest, that could enter that Only once a year, not without a blood sacrifice. And if he violated or if he wasn't even right in a certain way, he would die. They would wrap a rope around him as he walked in. So if something was wrong and he died, they could pull him out. Because in other words, he'd be stuck in there and be stinking up the joint. I'm serious. When Christ died, the veil torn. A lot of us think... It was so we could get to God. Uh Uh-uh. That's not why it was torn. It was torn so God could come out and get to us. Who's the temple now? Why? Because God lives in us. Let me give you a magical, awesome statement that we all hear all the time, and we just skip over it. Here it is. You ready? The Holy Spirit lives in you. We just skip right over that because we hear it all the time. But have you ever sat down and thought about the ramifications, the magnitude that God lives in you? You ever thought about that? If we really believed that in every situation, would we ever complain about anything? Would we ever complain about anyone if we really believed it? Maybe you don't understand that. Maybe you're looking at me like, okay, I don't get it. If that's you, there's no condemnation in it. But if that's you, that shows an issue that you need to work on relationship because obviously you have none. I'm sorry if that's too harsh, but... 
is, is the truth. Obviously, you don't have one. How do you have one? You get by yourself somewhere and go, God, show me you. Yes. Holy Spirit, teach me about Jesus. Help me with relationship. It's just that easy. I can't do it for you. No one else can either. Only he can. But he lives in you if you're born again. This was true in Isaiah 55. Turn to um, 1 Corinthians 2. We're going to go there in a minute. You can be flipping there. This was true. This was Old Covenant. This is Old Testament, remember? Isaiah the prophet. He had a, an anointing of the Holy Spirit in measure, but he was not the temple of the presence of God. The great Moses, Abraham, Elijah, they didn't have the presence of God as part of who they are, as part of their identity. They didn't have that. They didn't know what it was like to be a temple of the living God. Do y'all get that? They knew him as a hard taskmaster that said, you have to keep these lists, and if you don't, you're going to die. We know him as... Just believe and you'll live. Have you ever just thought about that? I don't know. It, it wrecks me. I, it, may not, it may not wreck you guys. No. What did I say? First Corinthians? Yeah, there we go. Here we find Paul talking to the Corinthian church. A very carnal church that still practiced pagan rituals and pagan witchcraft. Mm -hmm. This church. Yes. But here's what he says. So I said that so you guys won't sit here and say, well, but that must have been special Christians. I'm not good enough for that. Are you worshiping any devils? No. Okay, then that argument holds no water. All right. So here we go. Paul says there's a, there's, a, there's a wisdom, a knowledge that's available to us that if the rulers of this age knew, they wouldn't have crucified Christ. They'd have never killed him. Now let's pick up in verse 9. He's quoting Isaiah. I think it's chapter 64. Paul says, But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Now, you've probably heard that before, too. I've been preached that before from Isaiah that says you don't even have an idea of what God has prepared for you. Right? You've, we've heard that. Obviously, that's false because listen to what Paul says next. But God, my two favorite words in the Bible, but God has revealed them to us through his... Spirit. What does that tell me? That tells me that now through the new covenant, through the Holy Spirit, what was previously unaccessible before under the old covenant is now already revealed to me through the Holy Spirit under the new covenant. What was previously unknowable, has already been revealed to me through the Holy Spirit. All I have to do is learn how to access it. But the work has already been done. It's finished. It's already completed. But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit... Searches all things. Everybody say all things real loud. All things. all things. Even the deep things of God. Zach, where does the Holy Spirit live? In me. In, oh, in you. Yes, in me too? Yes, sir. All right. So he lives in us? Yes, sir. What does he do? He searches all things. Mm -hmm. Even the very, very deep things of God. 
Where does he live again, Zach? Yeah. Oh. So can I know his thoughts and know his ways? Yeah. Why? I mean, maybe you guys already knew this. This is cool to me. Amen. It's cool to me. He tells me things that was previously unknowable even to the likes of the fathers of our faith. Amen. Now he speaks to me. Amen. What's my part? I just need to have relationships. I, I, let me say this. I am, I'm, I'm, I'm not, this is, may sound blasphemous, and please don't hear what I'm not saying, but it's really my heart. I'm not so much concerned with my anointing. I'm not really concerned with trying to get more power or more demonstration of the Spirit. I, I, I'm not really interested in those things. I'm really not. I'm interested in knowing Him. Because if I know Him, then it, I don't need to worry about anything else. I don't need to worry about my anointing. Because I know where it comes from. What does this mean for you? Do you know that you all have a ministry as well? We've been learning about some of that on Wednesday nights. And just because I get up here and speak and you all look at me awkwardly does not mean that I'm here. You've heard me preach about this. Actually, if we were a football team, what position would I play? The water boy. I'm not even on the team. I'll never make a play. You guys make a play. My job is to feed you the living water. That's it. You make the plays. All right. Let's skip down to um, verse 12. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. That's the Holy Spirit. Amen. That we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. What is any better For his children to know than who he is and who we are in him. What, 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 what else could you possibly want to know? It's all I care about. I want to know who he is and I want to know who I am in him. If I can get that, I'm done. I don't care about when the dinosaurs lived. I don't really care about how the creation story, is it literal or, or a metaphor? I, I really don't care. It really don't bother me. Is Job a historical account of, of a real man or is it just a poem? I really don't care. All I want to know is who he is and who I am in him. I can't change any of this other stuff anyway. It is what it is. I don't even get worried about the arguments. Well, well when's the rapture going to happen? Is there even going to be a rapture? I have beliefs on that stuff, but I don't really care. Because if I know him, then I know I have nothing to worry about. He's always going to protect me, whether the rapture is before tribulation, during the tribulation, after the tribulation, or there is none. I don't care. I'm his. Period. And I don't have to worry about it. So that also relates back to, well, I got a bill in the mail that I can't pay. What do I do? Do I spies out and start calling the prayer chain for prayers? Or do I just start prophesying and declaring God's will over my life? Now, now, now here, I, I, y'all hear me. I don't mind phone calls or text messages or Facebook messages. Although if you're trying to Facebook message me, I'm really not on Facebook a lot right now. Um, but just text me or call. I, I don't mind the calls or the text. Hey, this is going on. Pray for me. I don't mind that. I gladly pray for you. It's, I, I look at it as my honor. My response to you would be, 
are you declaring and decreeing over your life? It's fine for, for me to pray for you. I, I, it's fine. But are you wanting me to pray for you because you're fearful and you think for some reason my prayer is better than your prayer? Or are you asking for two or three to come together in agreement? Now, that's something different. But are you asking me because you're scared? If you are, it's fine. It's something we have to deal with. I get it. But don't get mad at me when I don't share in your pity party. And I'll start telling you God's will over your life and what the Word says to tell you what to do. Amen. You declare and decree this over your own self. If you're not going to declare and decree God's will over your life, don't ever depend on anyone else to do it. If you're not willing to do it, why should anybody else do it? You know, pastor, don't pray for people. I'm just saying, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the same Holy Spirit that's in me lives in you. And just because I have a title of clergy in front of my name does not mean that the Holy Spirit in me is greater than the Holy Spirit in you. Do you see what I'm trying to do? I'm, I'm, we're in a war. We're in a war. We've already won. I want to see the church that's not going to limp out of here at the end, hoping Jesus saves us. I want to see the one that Jesus has to grab by the back of the shirt tail and drag off because we're too busy punching the hell out of Satan. Amen. Amen. That's the one I want to see. And we're not going to do that believing that we're, oh, poor, pitiful little me. I just that's right. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. We have access to his thoughts. Who his ways. What else do we need? You already have everything you need. Colossians says that the fullness of the Godhead dwelled in Christ bodily. And you were complete in him. That's the very next part of that verse. All right, we're going to close. Verse 16. If, if you highlight in your Bible or if you have a phone or something, I'm using an iPad, um, highlight this verse. Verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Let's stop right there for a moment. Does anybody know more than God so they can be the God's teacher to teach him how to do stuff? No, that's silly, right? God knows everything. He don't need anybody to teach us. He, he invented it. He invented anything that we could ever teach to anybody. He, he started it. You realize he invented joy. Yes. He invented pleasure. Yes. He invented happiness. Yes. He is the God of pleasure, the God of happiness, the God of joy. It's who he is. Amen. The Bible says he's so joyous over you and who you are. The, the Hebrew word there says that he actually dances and twirls when he thinks about you. Okay. Boy, it's a huff crowd today. Um, so who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we, everybody say, but we, but we. have the mind of Christ. It may have been impossible for, for Isaiah and the nation of Israel at that time to know God's thoughts and to know God's ways. But now we have the mind of Christ. <sighs> what else do we need, guys? We're good. Not only are we good, we're great. Even if the worst does happen, I'm still great. Even if it cost me my life, I'm still great. Because guess what? It's just a trick. I'm never going to die. We, we just need to shed some of this religious stuff that we have and really give our life to Christ. Because things in the kingdom work differently. The 
people that I see that we talk about really just get, just committing, really giving their life to Christ, the, one of the biggest things they tell me, I don't want to give up my freedom. I don't want to give up being me. I don't want to give up what I want to do. Let me tell you something. You don't even have a, a good holy desire that's not from God anyway. And, and, and the way the kingdom works, if you want to save your life, then give it up. If you want to be the greatest, go low. If you want to be great, become a servant. If you want to be the greatest, become a slave. That's what it says. If you need money, what you have, give away. It's the way the kingdom works. Up is down, down is up. Well, you ever seen Pirates of the Caribbean? Where, they, where they're coming back from uh, Davy Jones's locker and they have to turn the ship upside down. Y'all remember that? You ever seen that? Up is down, down is up. That's the same way with the kingdom. If you need money, give what you have away. If you need favor in a situation, start showing other people favor. We have the mind of Christ. It's not the mind of the world. It goes against everything we've been taught. Seriously, if I was a financial advisor and I had somebody come to me and say, well, we have a financial need. We need $10,000. And I'm going to say, great. How much do you have in your checking account? 4000 Give it away. You'll get your ten grand. i would probably go out of business. But this is the way the kingdom works. You need 10 grand, then give what you have away. I can't tell you, I, I, and I'll just tell you this right now. Um, so Christy and I started being a uh, monthly donor a year or so ago to Christ for All Nations. We give amount, an, an amount every month. It just automatically comes out of our checking account. And I'm just going to tell you, I'm blessed coming in and going out. I find money under, under rocks. I, seriously, I find money under rocks. Look what I'm driving. Can I afford that? Y'all know what I make. No, I can't afford that. But I drive it anyway. I don't know. All I'm saying, we have the mind of Christ. It don't work the way the world tells you that it works. It works differently. And if you want an increase in favor... Start operating with the mind of Christ and let the mind of the world go away. It's just the way it works. Come on up, Michelle. Um, I feel like right now, this is, uh, just, the Lord just spoke to me. I feel like right now that there's a grace here in the air. I feel like the Lord says he's heard your heart cry. He's heard your prayer for the things that you're afraid to pray for. The scripture behind that is the Holy Spirit prays for us in groans and utterings that, that, that can't be understood, even can't be heard. He's in us and he's always praying for us. And Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father who lives to always make intercession for us. So whether you know it or not, prayer is always going for you all the time. Do you know God's actually praying for you right now? The scripture was straight out of scripture. I mean, I, I didn't make that up. God's praying for you right now. And I just feel like the Lord says, I've heard it. I've heard the prayers that you were too afraid to pray. Because you're so afraid you can't even face the situation. And I feel like right now there's a grace in the air. There's just a grace to receive. There's a grace to receive. Some of you won't favor some of you may be jealous of others' favor that you've seen and you won't. I, 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 I think there's a grace. I, I, I think maybe in that situation there might not be grace without repentance, but, but, yeah. but there, there's, there's grace right now to receive. And the Lord said he has your own tailor-made blessing for you. Amen. That he's so good that you can't even... Yes. Anyway. And I'm not a prosperity preacher. You know I'm not. But the Lord is a rewarder of those who seek him. That's in Hebrews. The Lord is a rewarder of those who seek him. 
he is a rewarder by nature. It's who he is. And I just feel like he just wants to reward. Why? Because he's just good. It's just really who he is.